Let's open our Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 8. Today we're going to begin uh, looking at chapter 8. Before we launch into chapter 8, I want to go back and let's read verses 18 through 28 of chapter 7. After spending two weeks discussing Melchizedek, uh, his likeness to Jesus Christ, and his superiority to the Levite priests. And um, we have this summary of Christ's superiority to them uh, and to his everlasting priesthood on our behalf, our mediator. Let's go back to chapter 7 for just a few minutes and begin back at verse 18 down to the end of that chapter. For there is, and we talked about this last week, that if there is going to be a change to the priesthood, from the Levites to a greater priest, Melchizedek and Christ, uh, in fulfillment, then there's going to be a change in the approach to the law, because the, the, the priests were the enforcers of the law, and the interpreters of the law. Verse 18, For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, that better hope, of course, being Christ, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And it is the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy uh, 1, verse 1, blessed be the Lord God of our Lord Jesus Christ, and so forth, of, of our Father, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Back in the early 80s, I had a... But he had a bumper sticker on his car that said, No hope in the Pope. 1 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. I thought, I want to get me one of those stickers. But Verse um, um, 20. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests, the Levites, were made without an oath. But this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not spent, repent. Thou art a priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek, um, so much by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. The Levites weren't promised that they and their descendants would um, serve perpetually, or that any of them would live. They each died and were replaced by their sons, and they were replaced by their sons, and so forth. And uh, not a one of them lived forever, but Melchizedek did. The Bible described him having uh, neither descent or beginning of days, ending of days, and so forth. Nobody knew exactly where he came from. Um, it's a pretty good guess that he had human parents, but the Bible doesn't give us much detail. And in that respect, he was like the Lord Jesus Christ, who has always existed from eternity. We think about God, the God of our Bible, he never had a beginning. The idea of the divine creator, the, the source of all reality, never had a beginning. Everything sprang from him. And the Bible says, John 1, um, in him... Uh, all things were made by him, Christ, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, verse 3. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, and they, the Levites, truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. I just mentioned that. But this man, Christ, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. You know, some of the apostles that Lord Jesus chose were very unlikely uh, ministers of God's word. Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, fishermen. James and John, also fishermen. Um, Judas he was a betrayer. He was a devil. Um, Thomas was doubter. You know, he was more interested in... I, you, you could say Thomas followed after philosophical thinking in those days uh, when the Lord Jesus appeared to the disciples and Thomas wasn't present the first time. We've seen the Lord. He said, unless I'm able to put my finger in his print of the nails in his hands, I'll not believe. And so there's always that skepticism on the part of people who want to comprehend everything with their mind and leave no room for God and uh, faith to be involved. But verse uh, 26, for such an high priest became us, God was manifest in the flesh, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, 
who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. But the word of the oath, referring to Christ, um, which was made, excuse me, uh, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore. Christ was a far greater priest than the Levites could have possibly been. And his forerunner, the type, typology, Melchizedek, who came even before the Levites were instituted, he was a greater priest than the Levites. He's the one that Abraham gave tithes to. So he recognized the authority of Melchizedek, whoever he was, as being greater than anyone else in the world at the time. Let's, con let's go on to chapter 8 um, and read verses 1 through 6 today. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. He says in verse 1, this is the sum. He's going to summarize chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7, like an attorney um, giving his closing arguments in a court trial. Verse 1, we have such a high priest. Spiritually and devotionally, for our sakes, uh, the Christian now has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, 1 John 2, verse 1 tells us. He's our representative. He is our um, defense attorney. When you sin, he reminds the Father that you have trusted in his shed blood alone as your, as your sacrifice, and you are trusting in him, and you're, you belong uh, to, the, to the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're part of his church. You are one with him. And so your sins of the flesh are not held against the, the destination of your soul. Thank Amen. the Lord for that. Amen. This is something that the Bible calls, or what the, the doctrine we call, spiritual circumcision. Although that particular phrase, spiritual circumcision, isn't actually found in the Scriptures. But we can conclude the definition of it by studying the Scripture. The, the unsaved man in the Old Testament the, the, the soul of a man was joined to the body in which it dwelt. And so the words uh, body and soul are used very much interchangeably throughout the Old Testament. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Well, the, the sin is carried out with the body. The body is used to commit that sin, but the soul is charged with it. And, um, you know, that's the old joke about the... the, the fire at the shoe store, you know, 2,000 souls perished. Think about that. But anyway, uh, in the New Testament, the, by the new birth, and it's a, it's, a, it's a doctrinal understanding, that the soul is no longer joined to the flesh. It dwells within the flesh, but because it's no longer attached to the flesh, like taking your hand out of a glove, your hand is in the glove, but it's not stuck to the glove, unless you, unless you put your hand in a bucket of glue first and then shoved it into the glove, then you might have trouble separating it. But you understand the, 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 the illustration. The glove looks like the hand. It moves like the hand, but it's not the hand. You put a glove on and hold it up and say, can everyone see my hand? And half of you would raise your, your hand and say, yes. No, you don't. You don't see my hand. You see the glove. But the body and the soul were very often... Uh, confused with one another in that sense. But in the New Testament, the new birth loosens that, that soul from the body. Colossians 2, 11 is the main text on this subject. 
so that the sins that you still commit with the body have no effect on the destination of your soul. That's already been decided. And you were regenerated by the Holy Spirit the day you got saved, the moment you were born again. But, um, so, and then, so spiritually, Jesus Christ is our advocate. He is our defense attorney. He is our representative at the right hand of the Father. Uh, doctrinally, we have such a high priest is going to apply to the Jew in the time of tribulation. This book is called the Book of Hebrews, after all. Um, and he will have a high priest in heaven. Uh, the Jew will have a high priest in heaven concerned about him. Verse 1 says, Who is set on the right hand of the throne of God, um, of the majesty. When Stephen was being stoned to death, Acts chapter 7, he said he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. Um, he wasn't simply standing there to receive Stephen when he died into heaven. That's sort of a devotional, inspirational way of interpreting that. There's got to be more to it than just that. He was standing ready to rapture the believers at that moment and let the Daniel's 70th week uh, ensue following that. That's part of the future of the Jew and the future of the world just before the return of the Lord Jesus. If the high priests and the temple leaders who, were, who represented the nation at the stoning of had repented, then they would have been rescued. There would have been something good happened to them while um, the rest of the world went to pot and went to hell uh, with the um, rapture of the saints. I want you to consider a few things uh, go, if you will, to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 3. And notice here, Matthew 3 and verse... notes here. Matthew 3, verse 16. Jesus, when he was baptized, <clears throat> went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The heavens open up uh, in connection with the first coming of the Lord Jesus and the beginning of his public ministry. Go forward to the book of Revelation. <coughs> uh, or rather, before you go there, go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. And uh, verse 64, Matthew 26, verse 64, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and then later coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, go forward to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation 4, <coughs> verse 1. Revelation 4, 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a, tr a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. <coughs> so heaven is opened at the first ministry of the Lord Jesus, the first coming of the Lord Jesus. It's opened, said to be opened here, at what we interpret as the catching away of the saints, the rapture of all believers. John is a great type of the entire church, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. The Apostle Paul says Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So John's a picture of the entire church. Revelation chapter 19. <coughs> Revelation 19 and verse 11. Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven open, 
And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. <laughs> Heaven is open at the first ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's open again at the catching away of the saints, and it's open again at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's read Stephen's words back here and uh, go back to Acts chapter 7. <clears throat> Acts chapter 7, and begin there at verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord. Heaven opens at the testimony of Stephen and the martyrdom of him, which happened just in the next verse or two. It opened at the first coming of Christ. It's going to open again at the second coming of Christ. And it opened in Stephen's testimony, Acts chapter 7. So there's got to be more to it than just Jesus standing to welcome Stephen into heaven. He stood up, ready to come back, catch away the saints, and let the rest of Bible prophecy uh, fall into place after that. Now, there are other texts that bear on this subject, and I'm, I'm just giving you the basic suggestion of it, but there's got to be more to it than simply uh, the devotional interpretation, which is always common with modern preachers. But uh, back to Hebrews chapter 8, and uh, verse 2 there says, A minister of the sanctuary uh, and of the true tabernacle. We're going to return to this verse later in the book, but uh, for now, he means you will have to deal with a high priest who is not from among the Levites uh, and in an earthly temple. Christ's priesthood uh, goes far beyond just this world, just beyond the limited scope of the nation of Israel. Verse 3 he says, therefore, every priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. That's what all Roman Catholic priests claim that they're doing. Lord, we you know, offer you these gifts. May your Holy Spirit come upon these gifts to make them holy. The priest prays as though he had some power to consecrate them. He has no power when he's Do you know that in every Catholic church, most Catholic people aren't even aware of this? They don't investigate their religion. They simply do what they're taught to do and believe what they're told to believe. But in every Catholic church, the altar, where the priest stands behind to you know, perform the wine and the wafer um, the ritual, inside every altar, there's a little hole cut out uh, somewhere in that altar, and they take the relics of some dead Catholic saint, either a piece of his clothing, if they're lucky enough to get a piece of his bone or, or a tooth or something, and they deposit those relics into that altar, and then they seal it up into the altar, and the presence of those relics is what makes the altar holy to be used in transforming the bread and wine into Christ's body and blood. Um, you know, you, you name a church, you know, St. Joseph. Well, you, you'd think to be consistent, they'd have some relic from St. Joseph deposit in there, but not necessarily so. The, the church isn't named after whoever's relics they claim are put in there. It's just named by, over in San Dimas, California, there is a St. Damien, um, who the local high school is named after. Uh, he was a Catholic missionary to Hawaii, the Hawaiian Islands. They were calling him St. Damien uh, and named the city loosely after him, San Dimas, long before he was ever made a saint in the Catholic Church. They were anticipating him being a saint one day. They worshipped him and so forth. They say, well, they don't worship saints. Yes, they do. Listen, those of us who aren't Catholic, we know what we see. We know what we see. We know what we hear. We know what we can read in books. You say, well, Catholics don't worship Mary. They simply honor her. I got a book down the hallway in my office, uh, the, the public prayers and things, uh, speeches given by Pope John Paul II, and at least two or three times in his public speeches, he said, 
he prayed to the Virgin Mary in front of an audience and said, those of us who adore you, who follow you, who are consecrated to you, who worship you. So don't, listen, if I have to take your word for it, or the word of one of your popes, I guess I'll take his word for it. He knows what you believe. <laughs> Even if you don't know what you believe. But every priest says he's offering spiritual gifts to God. He's transforming that bread and wine into the human flesh and blood of Jesus. This is how a Catholic gets Jesus in him. <clears throat> By actually eating a piece of bread and drinking, a, or if he's lucky enough to get a sip of the wine, usually the priest finishes that off, and the people don't get any. <laughs> now, notice, you ever, you ever go to Catholic Mass, if you ever had to go with some relative or friend, or maybe you were Catholic, um, the priest drinks the wine, and the people want to get the wafer. Uh, once in a while, they'll let the people come up, and everyone takes a sip of the same chalice, oh. and uh, the person giving it, usually the, you know, the altar helpers, ministers, they've got their little uh, towel to wipe the edge of the cup after each person puts their lips on it. But I don't, I don't see them being real efficient, you know? <laughs> Thorough, <laughs> I want that thing clean before I put my lips on it. Uh, who knows how much backwash has gone in? Just, oh, yes. oh, oh. But so generally speaking, uh, the people get the wafer and the priest gets the wine. And if they have more wafers set aside and uh, then the people that come to take it, not everybody comes forward to, to take the communion. So they take those excess wafers and they put them in this brass or bronze uh, container called the tabernacle. And they lock it so that no one can break in and steal it. Because they believe those wafers are now the human flesh of Jesus. Made flesh by the power of the priest. And the Holy Spirit. You know, let's give him some credit too. But they put that in there. And um, a, a true devoted Catholic walks by there. And every time he walks by that tabernacle, he's supposed to genuflect. Because he believes inside that container is the human flesh of Jesus. The actual human body. Um, but you notice that the, the wafers, the excess wafers, are put in safekeeping. But the wine always gets finished. <laughs> Somehow the wine always, there's nothing that left behind. You know, you say, you're a sacrilegious pastor. No, I'm not. Because there's nothing spiritual about that. I'm not making fun of something that's spiritual. I'm making something, fun of something that's not spiritual. So I'm doing harm to nobody. I'm enjoying it, too, while I do it. <laughs> but every, or, every priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, the verse said. Um, but their sacrifice, look at, look at um, Hebrews 10 and verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Also verse 11. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Now he's talking about the Levites, he's talking about the bulls and goats and the turtle doves and the, the animals commanded uh, in the Old Testament by the Levites to the Jews. But the same principle applies to any kind of sacrifice, thinking this is going to cleanse me of my sin. But it's not good just once, you've got to keep doing it over and over again. As I said last week, if, listen, if the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, or the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, has to be repeated all the time by some priest, then his, his death is no more powerful than the death of the animals before him. And if his death isn't all sufficient to wash away, to, to cover your sins one time for good, it'll never be sufficient no matter how many times it's repeated. You think simple logic would take over and kick in once in a while, but it doesn't. And um, I'm just going to digress for a minute, go down a, a cul-de-sac and show you something, and we'll come back to the main road in a minute here. But Back in John... <clears throat> Chapter 6, verse 53, the Lord Jesus said, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And the Catholic will say, See, we take the scriptures literally. When Jesus said, This is my flesh, we take it literally, that was his literal flesh. But in the same, but a text without its context is pretext. 
And in the same chapter, go back to verse 35, and Jesus said, um, I am the uh, bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. The way you eat his flesh and drink his blood is by coming to him by faith and believing. That's how you partake of his flesh and blood. It's a spiritual transaction. It can only, be, it can only happen in the unseen world between you and God. Some actual, some physical element cannot affect a spiritual change inside of you. In the Catholic Mass, the priest holds up the bread and says, On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, he gave you thanks and praise, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which shall be broken for you, or my flesh, which is, or my, my blood, which shall be shed for you, and so forth. And in the Catholic Mass, they they recall the night Jesus gathered with his disciples in their, in their missal, in their, their, format, their format. Well, you go back to the night Christ was with his disciples, the night before Calvary, and he said, this is my body, this is my blood, which shall be shed for you, and so forth. And the, the Council of Trent, 1546, said that if anyone shall deny that in the wafer, in the sacrament of the Eucharist, and the blood is not contained the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, the entire Christ contained in those elements, let him be anathema, accursed. So those things are supposed to give someone salvation when you eat that bread or drink that wine. If, if those elements were powerful enough to grant salvation to the disciples, the night before Jesus went to Calvary. What was the purpose of him going to Calvary the next day? That's right. That's right. I mean, if all of it could be affected with a, some bread and wine on a table, you don't need to have a, the Savior actually beaten, bloody, and scourged, and crucified, and hanged up for six hours on a cross. You don't need that. If all of it could be affected uh, and accomplished through the bread and the wine the night before. Now, if a Roman Catholic said, well, those things were simply symbolic of what he was getting ready to do the next day, then you've got them. Yep. Because every one of their masses says on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. They recount the night before. And if that was symbolic, then all of these others have to be symbolic as well, because they're based on that one. So this can't be the literal body and literal blood of Jesus Christ. Over there in Lanciano, Italy, is an old Catholic legend. They claim some priest about 600 years ago uh, was doubting whether the body and blood of Christ um, actually came into the elements or they were actually turned into the flesh and blood of Jesus. This is in a little town in northern Italy and somehow during the, the mass he was performing, something about that told him this is real human flesh. This is real human blood. Um, so they, he kept some of the, those wafers put in a crystal container and some of that blood also in another crystal container. And it's been there as a museum pieces for several centuries now. And they claim, that the, the story goes like this, they claim that modern day uh, scientists have been able to analyze this and confirm that it was indeed human flesh. And they go so far as to say as they even confirm it was cardiac tissue, came from the heart. And they confirm that these little coagulated <coughs> globules, whatever shape they're in now, centuries later, was actually human blood. Which raises all kinds of other interesting uh, right. possibilities. Well, why don't we take some of that with the modern science of, you know, DNA and, and uh, cloning? Let's clone it and see what we get. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but let's suppose... And, and people go there and they want to press their rosary beads against that thing if they can, or the crypt of some Catholic saint at the Vatican, and uh, they think they're going to get a blessing. They're that famous statue of Simon uh, Peter, St. Peter, in the Vatican, and, it, and it's bronze. And the, the foot has been kissed so many millions of times by faithful Catholics over the centuries that the toes are just about worn off on that statue. But uh, let's just suppose that that those elements in those containers really are human flesh and human blood. 
Who wants to stick that in their mouth? What sane person wants to eat that or drink that? I mean, didn't the Lord Jesus say, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you? So nobody's getting saved looking at it in a crystal container. You have to stick it in your mouth and swallow it, my friend, if you want to be saved. What lunatic would do that? By the way, I'm at, I always say by the way when I think of something I want to add to it. In uh, Alexander Reverend Hislop's book, The Two Babylons, written over a hundred years ago, he talked about the words uh, uh, ka'ana, which is an Egyptian term, meaning a priest, and Baal, Baal, they used to pronounce it Baal, Baal, the sun god. And so Kana Baal meant a priest of Baal, from which we have the English term cannibal. Oh, wow. Someone who believes in eating human flesh. And uh, you see that, that sun disc around the uh, halo around the heads of every Catholic saint, every Catholic pope that's depicted. You'll see that, that halo around their head. Show, supposedly showing that they're holy and pious, they have the spiritual power on them. You'll find the same halo depicted around the heads of uh, Buddhist statues, Hindu deities. They all have that same idea, that, and all of that comes from an ancient belief in the sun and the deity of the sun. Somehow the sun, um, uh, the, the Roman word is uh, soul, from which we get the word solar, and I think the Greeks called him Zeus, and so on. But that sun worship is transferred into religious mythologies over the centuries. And so it's not a far stretch to say that Catholicism, or at least the Catholic doctrine, is the doctrine of cannibalism. We're turning this bread and wine in, into our deity, and then we're eating his human flesh. He's saying, you're stretching it. No, I'm not stretching it. Put two and two together, my friend. They make four. Or in modern education, says so make whatever the kid wants it to be. You know? yeah. And he still gets an A. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so, but moving on with our lesson today, that the death of Christ was sufficient one time, one time only. That's all that was necessary. And the blood of the animals before couldn't... Uh, cover a man's sins or, or remove his sins permanently. When he sinned, he would offer a sacrifice as commanded. He would be forgiven of that sin, but the sin wasn't cleared from his record. It wasn't purged from his permanent record. And so he still had that hanging on him. And every time he sinned, he had to go make another sacrifice. That's why the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. But uh, the blood of Christ certainly can. Verse 4 in our text, for if he were here on earth, he should not be a priest. Well, Christ was here before he was a prophet. Go back to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. And um, here, notice Jesus' words, verse 4. Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and his own house. John chapter 9. John chapter 9 also. John 9, after the, this blind man is healed, verse 17 John 9, 17, they say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. When the Lord Jesus came to this world, he was a prophet. He claimed that the temple was his temple when he drove out the money changers. In Matthew 21, 13. Um, we don't need to turn there. But he says that it's written, uh, um, My house, my house, shall we call the house of prayer. But ye... have made it a den of thieves. The temple was Christ's temple. He didn't need to go there and offer a sacrifice. The sacrifices were to him, indirectly, because he was God manifest in the flesh. 
He didn't need to offer sacrifices for sins because he had no sins. That's why we never read about the Lord Jesus bringing an offering to the temple in his day. He didn't need to. Um, and he didn't need to offer gifts. As the text said by the priest, he was God's gift to the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, we like to talk to John, about John 3.16, but there's nothing in John 3.16 that mentions the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But it mentions the love of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This was God's demonstration of his love for the world. And um, if you want to know the love of God, you have to go where he has deposited it. Now, he did deposit it at Calvary. Uh, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God commended his love toward us, Romans 5, 8 said. So, if you want to know the love of God, it's not just some ethereal feeling out there floating in the world, and, you know, you might run into it once in a while, you might feel a little, you know, warmth in your body or your mind, and you say, well, I know the love of God. You don't know anything. You... Find the love of God where he has deposited it. And he deposited it at Calvary when the Lord Jesus died for sinners. That's where you go if you want to find it. Until you go there by, as a sinner by faith. And you can only go there by faith because it happened 2,000 years ago. You will go there by faith as a sinner and say, I believe that Jesus' death was for my sake. He suffered for my sins because he loved me enough to die as my substitute. And the best way I know how... I'm asking God that he would uh, forgive me, uh, make sure my name is in the Lamb's Book of Life for eternity, wash me clean from my sin, and grant me a place in heaven, and let me live for him with whatever time I have, whatever talents I possess. You, you, you yield yourself to him, and uh, take his death for your sake, and apply it to your needy soul. And um, Brother Charles and I have talked about this before, that you don't need some fancy uh, words. You don't need some pre-written uh, prayer uh, to tell you exactly what to say. Listen, if a guy is lingering on the street corner after just having been hit by a car, you're waiting for the paramedics to arrive, and you don't know if he's going to last forever. You have a minute to talk to him about his soul. Say, listen, cry out to God. Just ask God to save you. Save you right now. Trust Jesus Christ. He died for your sake. Just trust him. And however the person does that, if they do it in their heart, God hears it. God sees it. He understands it. I know a lady, she and her husband had a, an accident. Their car flipped over coming back from Las Vegas about two and a half years ago. He died on the scene, and the car was flipped over, and she was banged up and uh, half conscious. And, uh, you know, that, that long stretch from Las Vegas to here, it's a lot of, a lot of nothing. And... Uh, other cars pulled over to the side of the road. And I'm sure someone had called dial 911 waiting for emergency services to arrive. And she said, some people came to me and they were talking to me. Uh, I was stuck in by the seatbelt by the, in my side of the car. And uh, they tried to talk to me about Jesus and uh, help me pray. And after I did that, then I, I went unconscious. And I've talked to this lady. She's Vietnamese. And this... <coughs> There's just something about her demeanor, there's something about her personality that makes me think she got saved. She's not even really fully aware of what happened. She needs someone to come along and, and nurture that, help teach her the Bible more fully. Because she was unconscious and was uh, in a coma for like six months after that. She didn't even attend her husband's funeral. Um, and now you see her, she looks like, you know, the picture of health, real healthy and so on. I said, you're a walking miracle. God's been very good to you. And, uh, and she's the kind that, you know, an unsaved person, they tend to say, well, uh, good luck. And, you know, I hope things get better for you. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be hoping that, that you get well and things go well. But she's always saying, you know, uh, God is going to help you get better. God's going to help you get well and healthy. When I, when I told her about my medical problem. She was very supportive and said, you know, you know God's going to look out for you. She's praying to God that, you know, he'll touch my health problems. And I'm very, I'm very appreciative. But um, he didn't need to offer sacrifices for sins. He had none. He was God's gift into the world. 
And uh, look at, and God's sacrifice. Look at chapter 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. He offered himself as the sacrifice for sinners. Verse 5, back in our text, Hebrews 8, verse 5. Speaking of the uh, Old Testament prophets, who served under the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for, quote, See, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. This made me think, God cares about the details. God cares about people being attentive to his exact words, doing exactly what they're told to do. God cares about his words. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words mm. shall not pass yes. away. Matthew 24, 35 says. So he cares about his words, not just the message, not just the general theme, not just the, sort of the general teaching that can be derived from the Bible. There's enough in a Jehovah Witness Bible you can derive to show that Jesus is Jehovah. <clears throat> my dad's uh, witness to JWs on his uh, doorstep using their Bible. He said, can I show you something in your Bible? And <laughs> spins their head around and they say, hey, can I have my Bible back, sir? <laughs> so, so there's enough, you know, if you want to sell a basket of rotten apples, you have to put some good ones on top to fool the customer. And there's just enough truth in every version or perversion of the scriptures that you could show the gospel of Christ the need for trusting Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ uh, is God, and then was God manifest in the flesh. But everything else is garbage. But you have to have just enough good apples on top to fool a sucker. And um, then verse 6, where God cares about the details of his word. So he says, uh, see that thou make it after the pattern showed thee, showed thee in the mount. And then verse 6, but now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. The, Lord, the death of the Lord Jesus did what the animals could not do. They were com God commanded men to bring a sacrifice to the Levites, to the tabernacle, and then to the temple. And the Levites were the mediators. They would offer the sacrifice, sacrifice on behalf of the sinner that came. But the animals were not equal to man in God's estimation. So they were not able to cover the guilt of the man. They were what God commanded, and if a man was obedient to, to follow those commands, he would die among the righteous. But the animals themselves were insufficient to cover the sins of a man permanently. Because in God's economy, man was greater than the animals. He, in fact, man was given dominion over the animals, Genesis 1. What man needed was a sacrifice that was not only equal to him in value, but even greater than him in value. That way, the death of that sacrifice was more than sufficient to cover all the sins of the man from then on. And that was the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, what a wonderful thing and which was established upon better promises. He says, how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. First Timothy, I want for devotional purposes, First Timothy 2, 5 says, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So the Lord Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. And as such, when he died on behalf of the sinner, it was more than enough to cover the guilt of every sinner. Think about God. You say, well, how could one man's death cover the sins of the entire world? Every person in the world, every sin committed in the world, past, present, and future. How could one man's death be sufficient uh, payment for the sake of everyone's sinner, for everyone who's a sinner? Well, it, it's, it depends on who the man was, right? Mm -hmm. Depends on who it was that was suffering for the sake of the sinner. Was it simply a good man, or was it the God man? If God, in the flesh, died on your behalf, and God lives forever, God had no beginning or end, 
Um, and Jesus Christ said, uh, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. His Bible is going to exist as long as he exists. And uh, your sins are going to be covered by his death as long as he exists. And uh, so many things that are eternal are based upon the fact that he's eternal. That's about the best way I can summarize it today. 